You're my music, but you tear me to pieces. So where does it come from? The scene that keeps playing on repeat ignores the rule of thumb. Oh, where does it come from? Oh, where does it come from? What is up everyone, thank you for tuning in to the first episode of the video chats that I will be doing over the next couple of months with GEA influencers, GEA ex and current footballers and also GEA coaches. So enjoy the video, we got Brian Keane first up and I know Brian Keane over the last year, he's got a crazy, crazy social media presence, he's also an online coach and he is also um, a speaker at certain seminars as well. So enjoy the video. I've linked everything involving Brian down in the description box. Check him out. Also, give it a thumbs up and subscribe and refer a friend because um, I really want to work on this over the next couple of weeks and bring as much content and entertainment to you guys. So, hope you enjoy the video and here goes. Yo! Is it working? Let me see. Jesus, where are you? There we go. Can yeah. you see me? Yeah, I see. That, that should be okay yeah. now. Oh, fuck. It's sorted now. Mm. How's that? Any better? You're, you're coming through perfect on my side again. Perfect. I'm currently drinking the mushroom shit. Yeah, it's good, man. Like, it's fucking... I, well, I don't know if I noticed the difference. I put fucking... Um, I put crepilic acid in it as well, so I put MCT oil through it. Okay. It's just like fucking rocket fuel if you're taking on an empty stomach. You're just like... Fucking yeah. brains go crazy. You're I'm super, like, you're, the right fucking ten bucks. <laughs> you're super. You're really, really alert, but you don't have the jitters, which is good. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Coffee makes me really fucking edgy. Yeah, like, yeah, really like, angsty. I coffee, and I'm like, oh shit, everyone's talking about me. So I like that steady fucking release. It's good. Good. Um, I think I've just realised that we're going to be able to curse on these uh, video calls, so we can. F and blind I, away. I can, I can cut the person. I do interviews all the time where I don't curse. So if we're if we're recording, whenever we like, I, I assume you're are you recording now. I'm always recording. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just have it in case, like, just don't say anything incriminating. Um, yeah, I can stop recording. Like, I can stop yeah. cursing. I can. No, no, no. I, I, I want you to curse. I want this to be as laid back as possible. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Um, yeah, so literally rule with it. Uh, I, I I read like the first question you said and I was like, well, just free flow it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just, as, the movie grand. <laughs> as, as laid back as possible. Um, there is some interesting questions I want to ask because I do understand that you do a lot of podcasts with influential people around the world, but I want to know, get to know you better, right? Yeah. Um, I want to know about your bodybuilding background, your GA background, um, you know, school and whatnot. So we'll just fire away with a couple of questions. I got these from my own head. I didn't even have time to yeah. ask my audience what they wanted to hear because a lot of the people will know you from social media anyway. So yeah. um, one of the questions was, we're going to start back from the start and how did you get involved with starting uh, your own self-employed business regarding fitness and health? And then basically tell everyone a little bit brief about your school days and then leading into college. Yeah, so my background, I suppose the best way is to do it chronologically in terms of, of timeline. So school um, was, was kind of the traditional GA head coming through school. Like I wasn't very good at secondary school. I was the highest end of anyone that follows me that's listening now. The stuff I know, I know very, very well. And the stuff I don't know, I know nothing about. And that's what I was like in school. It's just like 100x now that I'm older. Um, so I did amazing in things like English. I did amazing in things like biology. I did amazing in home economics. And I nearly failed everything else. So it was that kind of schooling coming through. Did a leave insert. Had a pretty poor leave insert again. Got A's and B's in my good subjects and got D's and everything else. Um, and then went and did a business degree. So my undergraduate was in business. Um, I did an undergraduate in business, kind of prioritizing in marketing, so a lot of my social media building, a lot of the stuff I do with other business and trainers that I work with, heavy on the marketing side of things, because I, I understand business from, from that background. Um, then we went on and did primary school teaching off the back of that, and that's kind of where I started the personal training journey, because I 
studied for, or I did a postgraduate in St. Mary's University in London for my teaching, which is a massive sports college. It's where Joe Wicks, the body coach, went. It's where Mo Farah went. Wow. It's a huge sports college. Okay. Um, so I, it's where I kind of did my primary school teaching and education. And then off the back of that, I thought, well, this is it. I was about 22, 23 about 22 when I qualified, and I thought, well, this is the job I'm going to do for the next 40 years. I was like, I'm going to be a primary school teacher. That's what I'm going to do, and, and, and I might do some fitness stuff on the side, maybe, because it was always an interest. I'd always trained, played GA all my life, apart from a couple of years I took a break bodybuilding. Um, and what happened out of that was I got my first teaching job and thought, well, that's awesome. I'm sorted now. This is what I've always wanted. I was constantly telling myself, when I was doing four years of an on the screen business and a year postgraduate, I was like, I'll be happy when I'm a teacher. I'll be happy when I have a job. I'll be happy when I'm all set, settled and I'm ready to, to get that part of my life out of the way. And then I got my first job and I hated it. And I hated it from the first day I did it. Um, not so much that I hated teaching, but there was a combination of being, I went into an English school. So one, I didn't understand the English curriculum. They also don't have textbooks in England, so you can't really blag it like you can say blag in Ireland where there's a textbook, you take it out, you yeah, stay yeah, a step yeah, with the kids and you're fine. There's no textbooks or anything. So you're building all your lesson plans from scratch. And I didn't understand the system. Um, and I think I was in that false insecurity that I had that, well, I've arrived, I've made it. I've, I've, I've set out what I wanted to achieve. I got my teaching degree, I got a job. And now I have it. And then I thought I was going to be happy when I got it. What age were you realized, whenever you went into teaching? Say that again? What age were you whenever you went into the teaching? And I, I was a primary school teacher. So that was third class. Um, so eight, nine-year-olds in that range, that age bracket. And what age um, were you, Brian? <laughs> I was, yeah, I was 22. Like, oh, was so that's young. Like, I would come in and I, had, uh, I remember I would have all these mums coming in because I had like, 28, 29-year-old mums coming in, and I was there at like 22. I, was, I had to start wearing, on teaching practice, I'll wait till I tell you, Ricey, on teaching practice, the second teaching practice I had, we used to have to wear a shirt and tie to work, and I was pretty big. Like, you know, a farmer's build, I've got a massive back, like, just from fucking looking shit around on a farm when I, since I was 10. And uh, I bent over a table on teaching practice, and I hulked out of my t-shirt, out of my shirt, oh. the whole shirt up my lap split. Like it was so funny because the teacher that had the classroom was there. She was overlooking me. <laughs> she was my mentor, and uh, she was overlooking me. And I was like, "Oh shit!" The kids started pissing themselves, laughing. They were like, "Mr. Keith, the Hulk!" <laughs> I was like, uh, from, "From that time on, I I started wearing polo shirts to work." Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was funny when I was teaching and I had like pretty young mums coming in and they were looking going, who's this fucking young lad from Ireland? And I, I had these like polo shirts on. Um, so that was always interesting conversation because I was, there was me and the head teacher who was a principal. We were the only two guys in the school. Like everyone else was female. All the other teachers were female. That you know, great. my last school, when I, before I left teaching, I loved that school. Jumping on a couple of years, there was three teachers in the school and I think it was 66 women. Um, and one of the guys, one of the other teachers was from Roscommon, so there was myself and him. Oh my god, um, that was so awesome. it, it was awesome. Like, I loved that school because I moved on then uh, from that first job that I hated, and it was down to you know a combination of things. I signed up to a fitness instructor course off the back of that after the Christmas, and that, that kind of started the whole personal training journey. Um, but for for the good of two years, I worked both. So I worked daytime as a teacher, and then I worked as an e in the evenings as a personal trainer. So I went and got qualifications, got certified, um, and did that whole space. And, and for a long time, for nearly two years, 18 months to two years, I, I did both. And I called my personal trainer my side hustle. So it was the thing I was doing because I would have done it for free. It was bringing in extra income. Teaching money was terrible, particularly in London. It's really bad because the cost of living is high. Were you um, in a gym, was, Brian? Say that again? Were you in a gym? Yeah, I was in a gym. So I was in a combination of gyms where you gave a percentage to the gym and then you took your clients. Yeah. I then rented a space where you paid a set fee per month and then you took your clients in the evening. Um, and then after a certain point, it got, the, it got to the stage because I could only do a part-time and I'd only have you know a couple of clients, three maybe three clients, four clients in the evening and then again at weekends – I wasn't making that much money when I started paying the rent to the gym. Yeah, yeah. So I started taking people in the parks. 
Um, and that was something that I did. So there was a park beside. This was ridiculous. I put up a photo every once in a while as a throwback. I used to carry, I used to run classes and run one-to-one -one sessions in the park beside where I lived. Now, when I say beside where I lived, it was probably about a, an, about a 10 or 12-minute walk. But I used to go down, I got a photo, I used to carry a 24-kilo kettlebell, I used to put a 12-kilo and a 10-kilo kettlebell in my back, uh, into my backpack, it was one of those big mountaineering bags, I used to have bands in there, I used to have ladders in there, I used to have a 20-kilo vest, and I used to carry it down. Like, that workout, I got so fucking strong, <laughs> like, just bringing shit down to the park so I could train people, um, but it saved me a fortune. Yeah, I that was very paid. smart, yeah. Yeah, it worked really, really well, and then I started running classes. Um, and it got to the point then, Ricey, where I was doing well as a trainer and I was working as a teacher. And I loved my last school that I was in, I loved. I loved, I was teaching fourth and fifth class. They were a split class together. It's funny because some of them will probably hear this because a lot of them follow me on Instagram now because they're 15, 16 now. Like, so a lot of them are following me. I have a couple of them that I, I've even chatted to. It's amazing. But I loved that school, I loved my class. Um, I loved the other teachers that were there, but teaching was always a job. Yeah. It was always a, I knew on Monday I was going to work and I knew on Friday it was the weekend where personal training and fitness never felt like a job ever. Mm -hmm. And then I moved back to Ireland. I moved back to Galway, probably my daughter's three. So four years ago, four and a half years ago, I had no social media, I had nothing, no podcast, no social media, no book, no clients. So I came back. And one of the advantages I had when I moved back to Galway in the west of Ireland was the fact that the gyms didn't charge here at the time. Mm -hmm. So I came back and I went into the Galway City Gym. It's where I got into bodybuilding first. They were amazing in there. But they used to just, you know, they were like, well, look, you're bringing in people from the outside. They'll pay their five euro pay as you go, whatever it was. And then I, used, I was able to keep my, my fee, which was, it was 25 euro at the time. It started at 20 euro. And... I was able to build up a business there. What I started doing was I started taking clients for free because no one knew who I was. I literally moved back. I was this guy from 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 London for as far as people knew because I live out in Connemara in the middle of – I'm an hour from Galway City. I live in the middle of nowhere. So no one in the city knew me. No one knew anything about me. And I started taking people for free and doing other – workouts that were specific to each person. If I had a GA player, I did a strength and conditioning workout. If I had Sally who was – 45 years old with three kids and overweight, I did a workout that was towards her. Mm -hmm. And people started to see that I was doing different things with different people. And then the people I took for free started to transform. And then they were spreading word of mouth to me. And then I got clients off the back end of that. Like yeah. I went from, I was very, very fortunate. I went from having zero clients to a six month waiting list in less than a year wow. because yeah. of that, because it just, it, it spiraled. I did a couple of things that helped. Like I, one of the things a lot of the other trainers weren't doing at the time was I took control of everything with my clients. So I was literally like, leave your brain at the door for the hours you're with me. I've got the workout covered. When you're not with me, here's what you do on other days. So here's your workouts for other days. Here's your nutrition. Text me if you're struggling with a meal or a recipe and we'll figure it out. So I was literally like, look, you worry about your life. Do the things that are worrying you, stressing your work. I've got your fitness covered. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was charging for the same price as other trainers that weren't doing that. So what happened was I started taking clients from other trainers. So there was a lot of resistance initially as well because I was taking clients off a lot of the other trainers in the gym. And it started to build up. And as a result, I was able to kind of build that business model. And then I started working on social media around that same time. Um, I went into bodybuilding during that time purely as an in to separate me from other people. So at the time, I had nothing to distinguish me from other people except for the fact that my clients were doing well. But there was other trainers whose clients were doing well too. But bodybuilding, there wasn't people doing a lot of it at the time, particularly the things like the muscle model, fitness model, men's physique. Those categories were nearly new. And I jumped straight into those. I started doing photo shoots left, right, and center. I did my first show with that Miami Pro in, in London. I came forth in that show off the bat, and it started to propel me up in terms of social media following, and as a result, I started prepping people for shows, and then it kind of circulated and spiraled from there in a positive way, and again, it's, it's one of the reasons that I did bodybuilding for two years. I got what I wanted out of it, and it, it, it propelled and got my business off the ground, gave me something different, and then the commitment side of it, like I did my last show, I did the, 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 the WBFF World in Las Vegas, 
three years ago, I came eighth in that, so eighth in the world in, in the muscle model category. I did really well. My mom watched it on pay per view, and I came out of that. My daughter was about four months old at this stage, and I was like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. I'm like, that's it. I was like, I'm done. I'm out. No more bodybuilding. This isn't good for my health. This isn't good for the time commitment. I, I'm becoming a person I don't want to be. I'm going to have to make decisions down the line that I don't want to make. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I literally just wiped my hands of it and, and stepped away from it. Um, and that's kind of what where it went. That, that up until that point, I played GA all my life. I lived in California for a year. I played out there. Um, when I lived in London, I used to fly over and back. You know, we, we won in All-Ireland with our club. I was flying over and back. I'm the only person on the team that doesn't have a county medal for that year, but I have an All-Ireland medal. Because <laughs> I was in the first half of it um, just because of other commitments and starting a new job with teaching. And then after the Connex, I, I came back with a couple of injuries and got slotted in and uh, I have an All-Ireland medal as a result. So that's kind of my timeline for personal training, bodybuilding, um, playing GEA. It's just a little bit of everything in there. So... Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's my life story in a nutshell. Over wow. a bottle of kombucha. <laughs> and now, now you're here. So the second question I was going to talk about is the actual club, Clem, Clumber, is that right? Clumber is my club, yeah. So Decky's playing county at the minute. Decky plays cornerback for Galway. That's okay. my club. Right. And you won it in what year? 2014? Oh, Jesus. I was 24. So probably about six years ago. Right, okay. So. Yeah. So whatever, reverse that time. 12. That got 2012. 2012. Um, I was um, going to talk I, I, to you about just the preparation. So you're flying over and back from England. Um, were you doing bodybuilding while winning all Ireland? No. Bodybuilding no, came after. No, no, bodybuilding was after. So for about, I was flying over and back. So all my gym work. I was. I always did say bodybuilding in terms of, I did body compositional work in the gym yeah. with conditional work. I just didn't compete on stage as a bodybuilder. Um, and I always had that frame. I, I have a, quite a muscular frame. It's farm based. Mm. Like I built my muscle from my, my foundations all coming from growing mm. up on a farm. You know? And but when when you were training with Clembur or even back in London doing your own training, did you focus on strength and conditioning work or did you stick with the, the bodybuilding style workouts? Uh, I, did, I did. It's funny because one of my main, my main flagship program now in GA is my GA Lean Body Program. The, foundation of that program was based out of what I was doing at that moment in time because it's funny because they always say in business you should serve, know exactly who you're speaking to and serve the people you want to serve. The people I work with now are the younger me's, the 24, 25, 26, 27 year old me's because I wanted, even though I wanted to be faster and stronger and fitter for football, particularly when I was flying back and forth, I also wanted to have a six pack. Of course, you wanted to look good, yeah. I was going out at weekends, I was a single guy in London, so I wanted to look good. And it's funny because that GA program, the foundation, I didn't know I was going to, I was going to have a program down the line that you know did so well, but what I was doing in London was very much the foundation. I was doing a body part, so I would do chest or back or shoulders or legs, and I would do hypertrophy parameters for some bodybuilding work, and then all the accessory work as opposed to being isolations were variations of strength and conditioning okay, movements or okay. strength and conditioning parameters. And as a result, I was able to get stronger. I was able to get, like I was, I was pretty lean. You know, I was, I had a six pack, I had a lot of muscle, because I was training for that. My nutrition yeah. was good and I was training for that. Um, and my strength and my speed, everything improved, particularly over that, you know, that year, because I, I wasn't even drinking that much then, because, you know, when you're, when you're going well in club, or going well with county, you're going well with college, or whoever it is, you tend to go off drink for a while until the season's over, and um, so my body composition was good, my fitness was good, but, um, yeah, that was the kind of training I was doing, it was a combination of both, which later on went on to become the foundation for that GA mm -hmm. body program. And just go back there when you talk about social media, when you made that transition, let's say, from teaching into fitness, and then even the transition to really push yourself on social media, did you deal with any, let's let's say, sledging, should you say, maybe on the pitch, or maybe um, people talking behind your back in terms of this guy doing something different, especially back then, you're on social media now, what, three or four years? Uh, yeah, probably about four years now. Um... Yeah, and you still have that. Like the truth is, you never lose. That never goes away. No. Um, like you have that in the beginning. The only difference is it's like basic psychological, you know, theory of exposure therapy. You expose somebody to something for so long, 
they get less afraid of it or it bothers them less. You know, there's been studies done with snakes, spiders, and yeah. all sorts of shit that people are afraid of. Social media is the same. At the beginning, it bothers you. And the first few posts, like, they rock you to your core. Yeah. You know, like, I, I had, um, I, I normally put quotes around my bedroom. Not so much anymore because I brain tattoo them now. They normally stick with me. But for when I started social media first and my business first, I had the quote, the only taste of success some people get is when they take a bite out of you. I had that plastered on my wall. It kind of changed my opinion on that. But th I had to refer to that regularly because I would put up a post and then I'd get slagged or people would be chatting behind my back and then all these things and it, it rocked me. Mm -hmm. Like, and it does, it rocks everybody. Yeah, like, I'm sure I see you were the same when you started first. Like, yeah. we all have that. Yeah. But it gets easier. Because one, you get realize, and I did a podcast episode, how to stop caring what people think about you. And again, I talked on that, that you realize after a certain point in time that everything's an opinion of that moment in time. So people have opinions and then they forget it. But we let it dictate the direction that we take our lives. We let it dictate what we fucking do. Like people will say, oh, Brian's a dick for saying that or, you know, Rice is a dick for posting that or whoever it is, you know, change the name. It's the only fucking thing that changes. And people will forget about it then. Like they forget about it completely. They'll say it, but we hold on to it and we attach to it. And then we let it dictate what direction we take things. And as I posted more and more that's why i got like super aggressive with my posting like and i still am i i put out a lot of content because you want to fail fail fucking fast you want to get exposed to something expose yourself to it fast yeah take like, it as a positive you know yeah like and that's it i just kept like there was a point when i had a video every fucking day like i was putting up a video every day and there was every stuff like some hit some didn't some were negative some were positive and i'm like after a certain point you can only be called something so often. You're like, nah, like I've been called that before. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's so you know? three years ago, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Like, at the start, in terms, have you played GA football uh, while you're doing the social media thing at the start? Or were you not playing football at that time? No. So, when I started social media first, I was heavy into the bodybuilding scene. And then I went back playing kind of recreationally after bodybuilding by very much just kind of playing club nothing too crazy and would you um, get any sledging at that time y yes but it was i kind of liked it ricey particularly when it was on the pitch i love like, it i okay it, it, i it probably sh uh, shouldn't even be saying that but like the more i get yeah. then the more i know that they know what i'm trying to achieve and they're like they don't want you to right it's fucking awesome. Like, I remember there'd be times when you'd, you'd kick a wide and somebody'd be like, all right, you won't post about that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, I said, but you know the next one that comes in, oh. you're like, fucking show you now. Like, and, and I love that. Like, to be honest, I love that. Like, it was all good fun because GA players, by their nature, like, most of us, and anyone that's listening that's GA player, you know more than your audience and my audience, we're pretty sound most of the time. Like we'll have the crack and we'll take it, we'll slag and we'll, we'll be dicks on the pitch. But how many guys do you know that are completely different on the pitch to what they're like off of the course, pitch? Of course, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So you tend to leave it there and have the crack. And I, to be honest, the, the GA crowd, and I think they're responsive to me, they're responsive to you, be, largely because we didn't have that for large periods of our life. We didn't have people putting out free content, putting out, this is how you get stronger, this is how you get fitter, this is how you get faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though we slag, the majority of GA players are really good in terms of, you know what, you're just trying to help. Like, other parts of the fitness industry, not as good with that, but GA players tend to be really, really good, I must say. Like, um, it's been a largely positive. You get negative comments and you'll have things you know, as always, you know, projection of insecurity, people, whatever that was going on in each person, they'll project their own shit onto somebody else. That's their thing. Like, but, um, but, but by and large, I think they're really they're just, they're awesome people. They're, they're, they're me and you, like, yeah. it's just, they're doing their thing and their equivalent might be working in a law firm or, you know, working in a school or whatever it is they're doing. But deep down at the core, same kind of principles, you know. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of just a couple of things that have happened on yeah. that side. Yeah, that's that's an interesting topic because a lot of like I don't really talk about that much because I don't want people to know that I care or anything. But it's a good to yeah. talk to you for that, you know. Um, a couple other now you might have heard some of these questions before from Tim Ferriss, but I think they're very very interesting. 
So yeah, one, yeah, the tip stuff's awesome. Yeah, I got <laughs> it. His books are just like scattered everywhere. Yeah, um, awesome. What was your top purchase over the last year? Most benefit you? Oh, my sleep device. My um, I have a sleep device, so I'm I'm a notoriously really poor sleeper. Okay. Um. And I, I really shouldn't be because I get up really early and I get a lot of stuff done during the day, but I get a second wind at night time as well. But one of the things that has helped me massively is it's a noise machine, like a sleep device noise machine that just plays white noise in the background. Okay. And um, I bought it for on Amazon for I think 60 quid, maybe 70 quid. And with the exception of when I was in Sahara for 10 days, I've used it every single night. It, go, it travels with me. It goes everywhere with me. Um, it, 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 it's my bread and butter that I use for, for going to sleep at night because I, I would be, you know, I'm a nightmare fucking partner when I'm in a relationship and stuff like that because a pin pin drop will wake me. Um, like a super light sleeper, but that just drowns out like noise. Particularly when I was living in Galway City, I live out in the, in the, um, in the country now. I've, my house is rented in Galway City. But when I was in the city, if you had people coming home from a night out or things like that, that would wake me and then I'm up, I'm yeah. awake then. Um, mm -hmm. So the noise machine, 100%, that's the best purchase I have. I can't even remember the name of it, but it's like the top selling one on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You definitely wouldn't uh, be good at sleeping here downtown Toronto. Right behind me is the window and it's literally like fucking Times Square out there. It's just Oh, like this. yeah, I've been to Toronto. Downtown is... is have you been here? going on there yeah i've been there a couple of times for the um the archangel so much that's on there in september's okay never heard of that but i'll definitely yeah, is it still on? check it out check check it out it's on there's another one in september um gary vaynerchuk was at it two years ago yeah uh i think lewis house was 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 at it last year um yeah really really good I, i've been to toronto a couple of times really really good spot um just a couple of just wrap it up soon enough um what are you not very good at Oh, loads of fucking things. I'd be easier to tell you than to answer that, right? <laughs> We're going to be here for another half hour. Uh, things I'm not good at. Oh. One, one big thing that you're really not good at. Tech. Tech. Full stop. Okay. I'm the biggest tech fool, which is so ironic because I run an online business. <laughs> uh, but I'm very, very good on the opposite side of outsourcing weaknesses. Um, so I have videographers i've got yeah, people yeah, the podcast i've got a tech you know patrick does all my tech all the website stuff um i'm really really poor at tech like shockingly so um just i'm very very poor it's funny because one of the things that used to come back particularly when i started building my platforms first i know it's on my instagram now seventy thousand or so and the same across other channels and when i started kind of building up my name first and building up my brand first People were like, oh, I fucking love how raw you are and how you, your videos aren't edited. As if you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason. So, like, and it's the same thing with the podcast now. I've got Tommy that edits it, but he's like, man, there's no editing to be done here. They're like, I just chopped out the intro and the outro yeah, yeah. because I do everything in one take. Like, I shoot everything in one go. But that was that's it. That's it. That's like, and that was down to not being able to use the fucking thing that edits your videos on your phone. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, thankfully, well, I don't. Well, I'm not bad at it, but the younger generation coming up are just gonna soon try to wipe us out. We just gotta oh. keep on top of the content because they're fucking. My amazing. God, I see. It's ridiculous. My, my three year old, <laughs> like, if I give Holly my phone because I monitor the YouTube and she's on YouTube, but if I get a message, she'll swipe up out of the message. She'll swipe over and click back into YouTube and go back into the video she was on. Oh. She's three at the end of May. Like, this is what we're competing against. You gotta, gotta fucking, get, you gotta get, get Holly. <laughs> you gotta employ Holly. Um, I'm telling you, as soon as she hits like teenage age, I'm like, right. You're, you're taking control of that, darling. This is all you. <laughs> um, another question. Um, tell me something that you know is true, but nobody agrees with. Uh, that every thought you have manifests itself into reality. You're, a, you're a big believer when, in the law I'm, of attraction? I'm, not so much the law of attraction, because I think the secret has kind of like made a bit of a bollocks of that. Yeah, I don't like but, the secret. No, but... I, I, before the law of attraction, the secret got big, I heard a lot about the power of intention, which is very, very similar, but it's basically just that I'm a big believer in that if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. Very, very big believer in that. And I think that a lot of the cognitive neuroscience is catching up with that now. The stuff with like 
the reticular activation system, the part of your brain that tells you what to focus on. Like the analogy, the, the example I normally use is if you walk into a room and someone's got the same pair of night trainers you have, they're the first thing you notice. Like there's sounds going on, there's other visual cues, there's people, but you notice the shoes because you have the same pair at home. Mm. That's your reticular activation system. That's your brain telling you what you need to focus on. And there's a lot of the science kind of catching up with that now. But I'm a big believer in that when you have an idea, I write everything down, like my fucking whole office is covered with oh. just whiteboards. Because <laughs> you write it down and you start seeing shit that you didn't see before. So I'm a big believer in the, the power of intention, this law of attraction, whatever name you want to put on it. Um, but but that, that if you, you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. Yeah, I agree. Um, right, Brian, I think we're going to have to wrap it up because I have a client soon, so I can't believe I'm waiting. <laughs> You're fucking all over it today. I haven't, reached, I haven't reached the point yet where I can you know work from home, but... Someday I'll reach there. You'll get there, mate. You see it in your mind, you'll hold it in your hand. It's only a matter of time. Now, Brian, we're not going to hang up on you just yet, but I'm going to finish off this video. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it, and I'll make sure and link all of Brian's stuff down below in the description box, and I'm sure we'll get plenty more of these chats again, okay? 100%. Thank you very much. Okay, see ya.